Mortality redefined as IC number 70 with Dr. Naina Jabin Haider as the Chief Instructor. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome all of you to the instruction course conducted by Regional Institute of Ophthalmology Trivandrum on ocular mortality called Mortality Redefined. We have three eminent guest speakers, Dr. Meenakshi Ravindran, Dr. Neelam Pawar from Aravind Eye Hospital, Tirunelveli, and Dr. Saumya Nambiar, Pediatric Ophthalmologist from Comtrust Eye Hospital, Talsheri. Dr. Saumya is a former alumni of RIO Trivandrum. We have our own in-house pediatric ophthalmologist of RIO Trivandrum, namely Dr. Arya R, Dr. Divya Kishan, and myself, Dr. Naina, to take you on board to situations which we encounter in our daily practice with our pediatric patients. I am greatly thankful to Elisa Joseph, Madam, my mentor and my teacher, for giving me this instruction course. Lastly, I would like to thank my friend and colleague, Dr. Sunil Emmas, for giving me guidance in choosing my guest speakers from Aravind Eye Hospital, Tindalveli. Hope you all have an interesting and informative session with us. It is a women's privilege and honor to welcome Dr. Meenakshi Ravindran as our speaker for the keynote address for this instruction course on ocular motility. Meenakshi Madam will be speaking on the advances in the field of strabismology. She has over 25 years of experience in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus and is a force to be reckoned with in managing challenging pediatric ophthalmology situations. She is presently working as Chief Medical Officer at Aravind Eye Hospital, Tindalveli, and is also a Chief of Pediatric Ophthalmology Services since 1999. She has completed her MBBS from Madras Medical College in 1990. She completed her Diploma in Ophthalmology in RIO Chennai in 1996. She finished her DNB in Ophthalmology in Aravind Eye Hospital, Tindalveli in 1998. She has been the reviewer for instruction courses and free paper in AIOS and Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association. She has innumerable publications in national and international journals. She is a pillar of strength and support to her students, colleagues and staff at Aravind Eye Hospital, Tirunelveli, and she has been known to passionately and diligently settle issues in her strength and wisdom. Over to you, Madam, for the keynote address. A warm welcome to all the participants of this virtual conference. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizing committee of KSOS and the chair of this IC, Dr. Naina, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to deliver the keynote address. Now I'll share my screen. So I'll be delivering the talk on uh, recent advances in strabismology. No financial disclosures. We will be discussing under the three headings, diagnosis, non-surgical management advances, and the surgical techniques advances. Coming to the diagnosis, muzzle pulleys are no longer theory. They have now been identified with the help of high-resolution MRI. And a lot of work has been done by Joseph Diemer in this field. And this pulleys help in the eye movements uh, very much. So there have been studies where they have shown that the instability of the rectus pulleys leads to incommittent strabismus and there have been articles that superior oblique palsy can be caused by them. And this high resolution MRI has also found us that uh, the major problem what it is with say several of the uh, strabismus disorders like myopic strabismus fixes which is seen in high myopes where you have a hypotropia and eye is adducted. This is the normal superior rectus and the lateral rectus, whereas in a myopic strabismus, the superior rectus has been found to be nasally displaced and the lateral rectus infra infraductally placed. And based on that, we have now the treatment option for that this is the loop myopexy where we join the superior rectus and the lateral rectus one third of the muzzle, 14 millimeters from the original insertion site, which puts the eye back into the muzzle cone. And this is the pre-op and the post-op uh, picture of uh, loop myopexy. And uh, it has also uh, helped us understand why CCDS occurs, that is congenital cranial deservation disorders, the coin termed in 2002, and MRI showing the absence of left seventh nerve and uh, absence of bilateral sixth nerve in a Bombi syndrome, courtesy is Dr. Pradeep Sharma's article, the photo is from that. And yes, OCT and UBM has made life easy for the strabismologist also, not only for the cornea and the glaucoma surgeon, Especially, it is very useful in resurgeries. Here you can see this is the anterior chamber angle, and this is the limbus, and the muzzle insertion. In and uh, in a UBM, once again, you have a better picture. You can go up to 14 millimeters. We can see, and the muzzle is seen as a dark shadow between the 
sclera and the this thing so where the dark shadow stops is the muscle insertion genetics is likely to play a very important role in the future in the etiology of strabismus and there have been found studies found that differences in gene expression there has been a down regulation of genes especially for muscle contractility in the strabismus patient compared to the normal patients and a duplication of the long arm of 8q has been thought to be associated with duvan's retraction syndrome the final thing is the stereopsis all of us know that in intermittent exotropia a break in the stereopsis a, a drop in the stereopsis plays an important role and the frisbee davis test uh, is very useful because it shows the distant stereoacuity and that drops before the near stereoacuity this is an article shared where uh, by dr pradeep sharma where he has said that a cut off of less than 20 second arc is an indication for loss of functional control and functional det deterioration and with this we can go on for if there is less than 20 second arc we can go for a surgical intervention and anything above 70 will not give any improvement in stereopsis coming to the non surgical management amblyopic glasses are there these are glasses where there is a, it's a liquid crystal glasses where there is alternating occlusion uh, by the darkening of the glasses between the two eyes and by this Uh, it's a like an electronic shutter so 50% of the time the eyes are occluded it is cosmetically more acceptable for the child and for the parents and we have the ipad games dicoptic games where the both the eyes are getting stimulated and the amblyopic eye sees the uh, red blocks and the green is by the normal eye and these are both uh, matched and how effective are they the two studies have shown that they are equally effective in both the uh, in both the age groups in the preschool children 3 to 8 age groups so from ipads eye pads we have improved gone on to ipads several drugs have been tried for treating amblyopia fluoxetine uh, levocarbidopa and uh, citicoline which have shown promising results but the only problem with all this is that the recurrence can happen and uh, coming to the surgical uh, management with the pharmacological drugs we have botulinum toxin which has shown to be an effective treatment in infants with large angle esotropia so instead of three or four muscle surgery we can get away with the uh, botulinum toxin alone so we have also uh, botulinum toxin with bupivacaine which gives good results so these are various articles on pharmacological management coming to the surgical management minimally invasive strabismus surgery is now available just like uh, other keyhole surgeries which we have in uh, cataract and glaucoma so this is a video shared by thanks to dr shandra for sharing this video uh, always uh, this is a radial cut is made in the uh, uh, muscle just uh, near the muscle it's just like a phonics based incision and uh, both sides you make hook the muscle and make the opening this side the only thing is when you dissect uh, you should be very careful when you are taking the bites so that you don't include the conjunctiva so that uh, it is a phonics something like a phonics base but much more complicated because you are not cutting the conjunctiva less than only 3 mm is cut so now we have put the sutures and then the uh, scleral bite is also taken as you see here the scleral bite is also taken and then we disinsert the muscle so when you disinsert you should be very careful uh, taking care as you can see the conjunctiva over it is still intact and then suture the muscle so the main advantage of mis is that it keeps the uh, it is very small and gives a cosmetically better result and faster recovery so adjustable sutures have made the surgeon's life easier there are many people who have never done adjustables and uh, i am just showing one technique of bow tie as you can see here you take a disinsert the muscle and then take a, a, a cross sword technique this is called as you take the needle in a cross sword fashion at the original insertion site and pull the muscle up till the original insertion and then use the calipers we here use the you are now pulling the muscle you have to be careful at this site because you can have a perforation it is the thinnest point now the uh, muscle is pulled up 60 bicrel is used and then measuring it you just put a simple bow tie 
and then do the adjustment either after four to six hours or the next day. Don't delay too much because it can uh, adhesions can happen. It will be more difficult. And don't do immediately also following anesthesia because it can have other uh, uh, effects. I'm not showing the siding nose. Muscle transplantation has been now uh, propagated for large angle esotropia. A small video uh, showing that. Uh, first, always do a FDT. And this is the medial rectus, which has been uh, isolated. And uh, you take a non absorbable uh, suture. Uh, I have used the bond suture. And then disinsert the muscle after taking the bites. Don't do anything, just uh, disinsert the muscle. Then this is a medial rectus. So, so after disinserting the medial rectus, we don't do, uh, we go on to the uh, lateral rectus side where we uh, take the bite at the whatever point we want the resection with the 6O vicryl. Only thing we difference is we put an additional uh, suture at the uh, original insertion site also. We take an additional suture there and then we disinsert the muscle. After disinserting, you reattach the muscle just like any other resection, you reattach the muscle at the original insertion site and then cut the excess muscle. After cutting this excess muscle, this is now the free end is now attached to the medial rectus side with the non absorbable suture, which is there. And uh, now we will get the extra muscle to attach to recess weaken so this is uh, this is better option because when you do a hang back or this thing it can get attached anywhere so this is one advantage that uh, we have a firmer attachment and uh, this is the main advantage there so this is a pre and post op picture of the case which we had done the other thing is muscle transpositions. We have uh, three options, no split, no tenotomy procedures, particle vertical, uh, partial vertical rectus transpositions, and Y split of medial transposition for lateral rectus used in uh, third nerve palsy. No split thing is the modified Nishidas, which uh, Dr. Neelam will be talking about the, all this in the next, uh, in the final presentation. And we have augmented Hemel sheen and uh, the Y split of the lateral rectus, which is transposed to the uh, medial rectus. And finally, not last but the least, is the periosteal fixation. All these four procedures will be talked by Dr. Neelam in the final presentation on the management in paralytic strabismus. To conclude, we are still pursuing the red herring coined stereopsis with improved diagnostic imaging and management strategies. Our outcomes are much better than ever before, but a lot more is yet to come. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Sandra Ganesh and Dr. Sabia Chachi for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meenakshi Madam for sharing with us these pearls of wisdom. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Arya A.R., Assistant Professor, Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Trivandrum, to speak on the topic, Mortality Examination. Dr. Arya did her MBBS from Government Medical College, Trivandrum, and MS and DO from Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Trivandrum. She obtained her DNB in 2012. She worked in government sector for three years, after which she joined Medical College Service in 2015. She also underwent two-month observership training in pediatric ophthalmology from Aravindai Hospital, Madurai. Currently, she is working in pediatric ophthalmology department in RIO Trivandrum. Over to you, madam. Good afternoon. At the outset, let me thank the KSOS team and Dr. Naina Jabin Haider for giving me an opportunity to present a topic in Drishti 2020. The topic for my presentation today is extraocular mortality. As you all know, extraocular mortality examination is an important part in screen evaluation as well as neuropathy cases where it helps us to reach a diagnosis. And before passing on to extraocular mortality proper, uh, let us have a look at the anatomy of extraocular muscle. So the four rectal muscles, that is the superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, lateral rectus, along with the two oblique muscles. Those are the inferior oblique and superior oblique muscles, along with the levator passive superioris, 
constitutes the extraocular muscle complex. Now coming to superiorectus muscle, all rectal muscles take origin from unlessal sin, which is in the region of the optic canal and part of the superior orbital fissure, and it passes forward to get inserted into the sclera at a distance of 7.7 millimeters from the limbus. The action of superior rectus muscle are elevation, adduction, and medial rotation or intorsion. It is supplied by the third cranial nerve, that's the oculomotor nerve. Now, the inferior rectus muscle, it takes origin from the analysis in, it passes forward, and it gets inserted into the sclera at a distance of 6.5 millimeters from the limbus. So, the actions of inferior rectus muscle are depression, adduction, and lateral rotation or extorsion. Inferior rectus is supplied by ocular motor nerve. Now passing on to the medial rectus muscle. Again, the origin is from analysis in, it passes forward and it gets inserted into the sclera at a distance of 5.5 millimeters from the limbus, which is the shortest among all the other rectal muscles. The action is adduction and it is supplied by the ocular motor nerve. Now the last rectal muscle that is the lateral rectus muscle origin from the analysis in, passes forward and gets inserted at a distance of 6.9 millimeters from the limbus. The action of lateral rectus muscle is abduction and it is supplied by the abducens nerve. Now the rectal muscles are over, we will pass on to the oblique muscle. The superior oblique muscle from its origin above and medial to the optic foramen, it passes forward parallel to the medial orbital wall. It hooks at the trochlea that is between the superior and medial walls and after passing through the trochlea, it fans out and it gets inserted under the superior rectus. The trochlea is a tube length projection around 4 to 6 millimeters in length. So the actions of superior oblique muscle are depression, abduction, and indorsion. And as in the video, you can see the inferior oblique muscle, which is shown in green color. It is the shortest among all extraocular muscle. It arises from the inferior orbital wall and it passes upward and gets inserted in the posterior and exterior aspect of the sclera. The actions of inferior oblique muscle are elevation, adduction, and extortion. Now, the rectal muscles are inserted not in a circular fashion around the limbus, and this constitutes the spiral of tilak. Now, this is a picture which shows the listing plane and axis of it around which the rotation of eye takes place. Along the x-axis, the elevation and depression takes place as a horizontal axis. Along the z vertical axis, adduction and abduction takes place. Along the andropostal axis, that is a y-axis, intorsion and extorsion takes place. Now, types of extraocular movements, those are the versions and ductions. Versions are binocular, simultaneous, conjugate eye movements, where you record the movements of both eye points together. When the versions are abnormal, you always check for ductions. Ductions are uniocular movements. Now, let us see which one muscles are acting in different positions of these. Now, in dextro version, which are the muscles acting? It will be the right lateral rectus and left medial rectus. Now, on vivo version, the muscles acting will be left lateral rectus and right medial rectus. Now, moving on to other positions of these, that is the dextro elevation, where the muscles acting will be right superior rectus and left inferior oblique. Levo elevation, where the muscles acting will be left superior rectus and right inferior oblique. Now coming on to depression, the, both the inferior rectal muscles will be acting. Now dextro depression, where the muscles acting will be the right inferior rectus and left superior oblique. And levo depression, where the muscles acting will be left inferior rectus and right superior oblique. Now, for checking the extra ocular movements, what are the things we should remember? Always ask the child to fix onto a target, give the child a target, fix the head of the child so that you can avoid unwanted head and neck movements. Show your target in a slow way, not in a hurry. You first check for the horizontal movements and then you check for the vertical eye movements. And you're looking down, you slightly elevate the upper eyelid of the child so that the view is better. Now, after checking for the vertical and horizontal movements, you check for the torsional line movements. That too, as we have did before, in a slow fashion. In different gaze position, assess the torsional movements of the eye ball. So, once you have completed this, you always check the saccharic eye movements also. For this, you have to give two charges and ask the child to focus on the two charges fast. That is, as you instruct, 
you say white red white red and ask the child to look into that you check the horizontal saccades followed by the vertical saccades also now once you have checked the extraocular motility you have to write whether it is normal under action or over action so in this picture you can see that the right lateral like this palsy it has been graded from minus 5 to minus 1 from a to e in the first picture the right eyeball is not at all moving in the second picture it is moving up to the midline but not beyond that see it is move, crossing the midline and 25 percent of total rotation d is 50 percent and e is 75 percent of the total rotation abduction is said to be complete when the temporal limbus touches the lateral canvas and adduction is said to be complete when the nasal one third of the cornea crosses the lower function so in this picture you can see how we grade the under action of oblique here you can see it is greater from a to d it is indicated as minus one to minus four under action refers to the number of segments of cornea above the light reflex of the reference side this is a subjective impression in this picture you can see how the inferior oblique muscle over action is recorded same principle as the previous slide now in this video you can see when the person is looking towards the left side on lever version the left lateral lip is not moving so there is a left lateral lip palsy and you can note the eyeball is moving up to the midline but not crossing the midline so the under action of lateral lip is greater than minus 4. in this video you can see when the child is looking towards the left side there is limitation of abduction in the left side and on adduction of the left side there is a retraction of the globe so we can say this is a case of Duane's retraction syndrome and in this video you can see in both sides there is inferior oblique overaction so this is a case of bilateral inferior oblique overaction now coming to past three step test past three step test helps us to identify whenever there is a hypertropia which is the muscle involved so when there is a right hypertropia it can be either due to abnormality of the depressors of the right eye that is right inferior rectus or right superior oblique or elevators of the left eye that is left superior rectus or left inferior oblique now ask the patient to look to the right side and left side and if the hypertrophy is increasing your left eye, left gaze you can say these two muscles may be involved that is the rso or lsr now you come to the third step that is the head tilt test if it is increasing your right head tilt you can confirm your diagnosis is right superior oblique palsy now look at this video the child is having a left hypertrophy you are doing a cover uncover touch in the primary position and you can see there is a left hypertrophy now you pass on to the second step ask the child to look into the right gaze you assess what happens to the hypertrophy whether it is increasing or decreasing in the video you can see the hypertrophy is increasing now you turn the child's face to the left and look what is happening to the hypertrophy the hypertrophy is decreasing or becoming less evident so you have done two tests two steps that is in the first step and by the second step you have concluded that it is a left hypertrophia which is increasing on right gaze now the third step you tilt the head of the child look what is happening to the hypertrophia the hypertrophy is decreasing and now tilt the child's head to the left and look what is happening to the hypertrophia you can see the hypertrophia is increasing so you have come to a diagnosis like left hypertrophia which is increasing on right gaze and left head tilt so your final diagnosis is left superior oblique palsy thank you and i once again thank the case of team and also especially dr naina jabin haider for giving me this opportunity thank you thank you dr arya that was a very comprehensive talk on examination of ocular motility thank you now i would like to invite dr saumya nambiar to discuss the topic evaluation of torsion and knee patterns. Dr. Saumya did her MBBS from Sri Devraj Medical College, Kola, and DO from Government Medical College, Mysore. She did her DNB ophthalmology from a Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Trivandrum. She completed her fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology from Shankar Nepalaya, Chennai. Currently, she is working as consultant in pediatric ophthalmology in Comptress Thai Hospital, Kandu. Over to you, madam. Hello everybody. First of all, I would like to thank Nana Madam and Elizabeth Madam for having given me this opportunity to speak on this virtual platform. Patterns are always fascinating and intrigue. So, this pattern in strabismus. Today, I am going to talk to you all about AV patterns in strabismus. 
The AV patterns are very common in our clinical practice of strabismus. It accounts for 50% of horizontal strabismus. Whenever there occurs a significant difference in measurements of horizontal strabismus in defined positions of up gaze and down gaze, a pattern is formed. So, I will be covering the following topics in my presentation today. The patterns could be an A pattern or a B pattern. A A pattern could be further an A ESO or an A EXO, while a V pattern could be a V ESO or a V EXO. So what do you mean by an A pattern? Whenever there occurs a difference in measurements between up gaze and down gaze of around 10 prism diopters, it forms an A pattern. While the difference between up gaze and down gaze measurements, if it is 15 prism diopters or more, it forms a V pattern. This difference in diopteric power is because physiologically there occurs a normal amount of convergence in down gaze. So this shows a V pattern exotropia. Here you can see that the exotropia is more in the up gaze when compared to the down gaze. This shows an A pattern exotropia, wherein the exotropia is more in the down gaze when compared to the up gaze. This shows a V pattern esotropia. Here you look for the esotropia, which is more in down gaze when compared to the up gaze. And the opposite occurs in A pattern esotropia, with esotropia more in up gaze when compared to the down gaze. Some of the types of patterns are X patterns. Here you can see that the exotropia is more in up gaze as well as in down gaze. This is because of the leash effect of the lateral rectus muscle, which can commonly be seen in chronic strabismus. You do have to remember other patterns like Y pattern, lambda pattern, diamond pattern, and arrow pattern as well. Now, what are the etiological causes of these kind of patterns? Many theories have been put forward of which the oblique muscle theory is the most accepted. Other than these muscles, certain anatomical factors can also play a role, like a mongoloid gland and anti-mongoloid gland, which is seen in craniofacial abnormalities, can cause patterns. The condition called as a polyheterotopia, which is detected on doing a higher resolution MRI, can cause patterns. So as you can see in the figure, you can see that there's a displacement of the lateral rectus upwards and the superior rectus medially, causing an A pattern esotropia. Sagittalization of oblique muscle insertion has also been thought of as a cause for patterns. This occurs because of the displacement of the normally occurring trochlea. Whenever there occurs an anterior displacement of trochlea, like in hydrocephalus with frontal bossing, the superior oblique muscle starts to act like a depressor, causing an A pattern. And when there is a posterior displacement of the trochlea, like as you see in plagiocephaly, it can cause a V pattern. Now, how do these children present to you? They can present with a chin up or a chin down position. And this usually is adopted in order to maintain a fusion. If you get a chin up position, you can think of a V exotropia or an A isotropia as a cause, while a chin down could be due to a V isotropia and an A exotropia. Now, when you evaluate for these patterns, you have to follow the following criteria. Always do a measurement at a distance of six meters, Always use an accommodative target and you have to measure the gaze with a chin down position with the eye looking 25 degree up and with the chin up position with the eye looking 35 degree down. Always remember to give the full refractive correction. And then you go on to measure the ocular motility. And in this, you have to look at the elevation and depression in adducted position. And then you grade the inferior oblique overaction and superior oblique overaction. Next, you have to go on for the sensory evaluation to look for the fusion. Then comes the main uh, examination, that is the fundus examination, which is usually done with the indirect ophthalmoscope. And here you have to look for what is called as the torsion. So what do you mean by torsion? An ocular torsion refers to the rotation of the eye about the visual axis. 
This torsion could be subjective or objective. Subjective is what the patient complains of and objective is what you see as the clinician. So the subjective torsion can be measured with the help of a double medox rod, a synaptophore, a Hess's chart or a begolini. Objective, as I told, it's done with an indirect ophthalmoscope. But while performing this examination, always see that make the patient look at the primary position, dim your room light and then look for torsion. Normally, you can see that the upper one third of the disc subsidence an angle of nine degree at the fovea and anything beyond above or below this position forms a torsion. But remember, the picture that you see with an indirect ophthalmoscope is different from that which you see on taking a fundus photo. The fundus photo will show a picture directly opposite to what you do through an indirect ophthalmoscope. So always be careful while commenting on the torsion when you look at the fundus picture and comment. The torsion when you do with an indirect ophthalmoscope can be graded as no, mild, moderate or severe. It can also be graded as plus one to plus four, depending upon the position of the phobia with respect to the disc. Now, what is the significance of this torsion? Whenever you have the subjective torsion, which is equal to the anatomic torsion, you can think that this torsion has been of recent onset or adult onset. And if you find that the subject is never complaining of torsion or that this torsion amount is less than the anatomic torsion, you can think that this uh, strabismus has been present since a very long time. It also helps in differentiating a DVD from overacting obliques because in DVD, usually you don't see this torsion. It also helps in differentiating pseudo overaction of obliques where again you do not see this torsion as a rule. In torsion, if present, it indicates that there is a contracted superior oblique while if there is a normal torsional position, it usually indicates an inelastic superior oblique. So when do you treat these AV patterns? Whenever there is a significant pattern, whenever there is an abnormal head posture and in case of loss of stereopsis. So what are the various surgical options that you can do? Either you can do an oblique muscle surgery, which is the most commonly practiced one, or the horizontal recti muscle transposition, or the vertical rectus transposition, which is usually not done because of the fear of anterior segment ischemia. So when do we do oblique surgeries? Whenever there is a significant inferior superior oblique overaction, you touch the obliques. But if the horizontal st uh, strabismus is also present along with it, then you can tackle the horizontal recti as well. Whenever you have a large A and B pattern of around 25% diopters, you combine this oblique weakening with half tendon with horizontal rectus muscle transposition. A uh, weakening of inferior or both inferior obliques brings about 15 to 25 percent diopters of esotropic shift in case. Hooking the inferior oblique has to be done carefully, and you have to see that whole of the muscle fibers has been hooked. The superior oblique can be approached either nasally or temporally. When you approach it nasally, it brings about a very large effect and it brings about a correction of around 40 percent of exotropia in down gaze. And when it is approached temporarily, it is less powerful operation, but it tends to cause less complications. A posterior 7 by 8, 8 tenectomy will cause a reduction of around 15 to 20 prisms of exotropia in down gaze. Again, superior oblique identification has to be done carefully because it's a very thinned out muscle and it fans below the superior rectus. Now, when do we do a horizontal muscle surgery? A and B patterns with minimal or no oblique overaction, you can transpose the horizontal rectus muscle superiorly or inferiorly. And transposing of this horizontal recti, we usually transport the medial recti towards the apex of the pattern and the lateral recti towards the base of the pattern. Now, one half tendon width of vertical displacement brings about 15% diopters of pattern correction while a full tendon width transposition brings about 25% diopters of correction. Monoocular surgeries can also be done and it is usually preserved for the amblyopic eye, that is supra placement of one recti and the infra placement of the opposite antagonist. This is because there occurs some amount of torsion because of this. 
This is an overview of the patterns and the different types of surgeries. Thank you for your patient hearing and hopefully we we'll see you all next year in real time. Thank you once again. DVD is an intriguing and confusing topic among postgraduate students and ophthalmologists alike. Meenakshi Madam will enlighten us with her vast experience in the domain of DVD. Over to you, Madam, for the talk on DVD. Good afternoon. Coming to the second uh, talk on DVD, I would once again like to appreciate the KSOS for this opportunity and Dr. Naina for this opportunity. So I will now share my screen for the presentation. So dissociated vertical deviation. No financial disclosures. This is a video which shows the DVD. Now closely observe the left eye. The Spielman's transparent occluder is in place. And here you can see the eye going up. And when you remove the cover, the eye coming down. So DVD is nothing but an intermittent anomaly of the non-fixing eye where the eye shows a upward excursion of movement, excyclotorsion and abduction. So it doesn't obey the hearing's law in a normal hyperdeviation. Uh, suppose that as you see here, the eye is coming down, the other eye should go up if it is a normal hypertropia. So whereas if you see here, now see the left eye, now the right eye if you see, that is also coming from up to down. So if it is a normal hyperdeviation, it will not happen. So the common associations are infantile esotropia, sensory heterotropias, and exotropias. The mainly many theories are there. Uh, the vertical vergence theory is the most common, that the persistence of the vertical vergence and the horizontal vergence centers uh, leads to the uh, uh, presence of DVD, as discussed by Belchowski. The other theories, you can go and read it up uh, elsewhere in all the textbooks. According to the classification, according to the committants, it can be classified as committant or incommittent. A committant DVD, when it is less than seven prism diopters in all the three gazes, is called as committant DVD. That is three gazes meaning primary, abduction, and adduction. And incommittent DVD, the deviation varies between the various gazes. And according to the magnitude, it can be small, moderate, and large based on the number of prisms. Coming to the clinical features, most of the time, it is asymptomatic. But the main problem is the cosmetic deformity caused by the slow updrift of the eye. So notice by friends and relatives. The patient is not even aware that the eye has drifted up. Diplopia and confusion are rare. And some of the signs are uh, there can be an associated fusion maldevelopment, nystagmus, previously called as latent nystagmus. And there can be an abnormal head posture where the head is tilted to the opposite side. Coming to the evaluation, uh, the measurements, various uh, techniques are there, various uh, evaluation, this thing is there. We'll go one by one. Coming to the first one, prism undercover test. What we have to see is closely is the, we put the prisms under the cover, under the occluder in the DVDI. So closely observe and you should always observe the uh, neutralization movement in the DVDI, not in the other eye. So in this also, the left eye is the DVDI. In the left eye, you just see the downward movement, which is not there if the prisms is neutralized. So the other eye, we do the, with the same thing in the other eye also. So now you concentrate only on the DVD eye and you can see the neutralization occurring. Sometimes you can have a combined DVD with an inferior oblique overaction as shown in this video. You can see the, see the beautiful down drift not the updrift, the downdrift. Sometimes that is more e easy to appreciate when the cover is removed. And you can see the inferior oblique overaction in the right eye. You can see that that is inferior oblique is also overacting. So when there is DVD and a true hyperdeviation, how to measure? So first measure the true hyperdeviation, that is see the hypotropic refixation movement in the contralateral eye with a base up prism to get the amount of true DV hyperdeviation. And then, as shown in the video before, do the total uh, vertical drift by the prism undercover test. And the difference between the two is the amount of DVD. The other test that is used is the red filter test. It gives a varied response in a, uh, it gives a very fixed response in DVD. Whether the red filter is put before the left eye or the right eye, the image 
the red image is below formed below the white image whereas in a true hyper deviation it varies it is below in a hypertropic eye and above in the hypotropic eye belchowski's phenomenon is found in 50% of the patient when patients are uh, shown uh, uh, with a decreasing light in the normal eye the eye comes down as shown here and as already told the head is usually tilted away from the eye with the larger vertical deviation differential diagnosis is primary or secondary inferior oblique overaction and in uh, i'll just highlight some of the points the differences the elevation is the same or uh, or seen in all three gazes adduction primary and abduction whereas in inferior oblique overaction it is seen only in adduction and primary gaze p pattern is not seen with dvd whereas is often present with inferior oblique overaction hypertropia is not seen with dvd usually but sometimes it can be associated with it whereas with inferior oblique overaction it is seen in adduction It doesn't obey Herring's law, which is a common question asked in exam. DVD doesn't obey Herring's law, and the speed of the deviation is slow with DVD, whereas it's faster with inferior oblique. Coming to the treatment options, the observation can be done when it is very less less than five prisms. The other main thing is encourage fusion. So for that, you give a proper refract, do a proper refraction, and give glasses. Or if there is associated horizontal strabismus, you correct that. because it can bring in some amount of peripheral fusion either with prisms or surgery switching fixation is another option where you fix uh, uh, close the normal eye either with a patch or with a hyperopic glasses but it is not uh, uh, cosmetically acceptable or feasible so indications for surgical management increasing frequency of manifest dvd a large head posture or a large dvd occurring frequently what are the things we should think about before surgery is the pre operative assessment which is much more difficult than the normal uh, uh, strabismus and sometimes we can the bilateral can be masked and which can reveal after the unilateral surgery and the asymmetric presentation the treatment for a committent dvd is bilateral superior rectus resection 7 to 10 mm which is the most uh, preferred uh, one and an asymmetrical resection in case of a asymmetrical dvd sometimes you may have to do an inferior rectus resection also superior rectus with fadens is now no longer preferred most of the times we don't advocate it because we go for a larger resection as shown in this video where we have used a limbal incision to and uh, good dissection is done to isolate the uh, tenons uh, uh, cut the tenons excess tenons and take the bite in the muscle so one thing we have to remember in this is when you are going for a 7 to 10 mm of resection make sure that you don't damage the superior oblique and you isolate the fibers and uh, isolate the rest of the tissue in an incommitant dvd you have three options whether the dvd is greatest in adduction abduction or after bilateral surgery when it is less than 5 prism diopters in abduction you can just go ahead with the inferior oblique resection alone and if it is more than 5 prism diopters in abduction dvd then you go along with the vertical muscle with an inferior oblique resection whereas if it is following bilateral resection surgery do not further resist the superior rectus but tackle the inferior oblique i won't be showing this video as dr nayana will be showing it in a presentation and when it is greatest in abduction you do a vertical rectus surgery with a ptso this is a video showing the ptso you have a fornix based incision so that the incision is very small and cosmetically acceptable and less irritation to the patient also identify the superior rectus and then superior oblique is isolated and the posterior two thirds of the muscle is now cut so the anterior one third is retained because it is very important for intorsion that is the one that is uh, uh, because if we go and cut the anterior one third it will go ahead and we will have a post operative diplopia so this is the pre op and the post op picture here the inferior oblique is overacting and post op you can see the eye is much better the main complication of the surgery is the recurrence which we have to explain to the patient and the hypotropia because of the uh, double elevate apalsy like picture when you operate on both the superior rectus and inferior oblique and palpebral fissure changes especially when you operate on the superior rectus sometimes you can have widening and uh, if on the inferior rectus you can have a narrowing so to conclude it is difficult to manage but even more difficult to measure and patient should be always counseled well regarding the multiple need for multiple procedures with a tailor made approach we can achieve 
success in most of the cases. I will acknowledge with thanks, Dr. Sabir Sachi for this presentation, my colleague, and thank you one and all for this wonderful presentation. We move on to the next talk now. The next speaker is Dr. Naina Jabin Haider. She is the Associate Professor and Pediatric Ophthalmology Clinic in charge at RIU Trivandrum. She passed her MBBS from Government Medical College Trivandrum, passed her DO in 2000 and DNB in 2003 from RIU Trivandrum. She obtained her FRCS degree in 2008. She has done a Pediatric Ophthalmology Observership in LF Angamali during the year 2008. She has worked as a pediatric ophthalmology registrar in Sultan Qaboos University, Oman, from 2011 to 2013. Over to you, madam. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank KSOS Drishti 2020 for giving Regional Institute of Ophthalmology Trivandrum the opportunity to conduct an instruction course on ocular motility. Coming to my presentation. Inferior oblique overaction in the child. Inferior oblique muscle abnormalities is the commonest muscle oblique muscle abnormality you encounter in a horizontal strap. It could be associated with an esotropia, exotropia, or it can occur isolated as an just an inferior oblique, or it may be associated with a superior oblique palsy. So just to recap on the inferior oblique muscle, it is the shortest of the extraocular muscles. It is about 37 millimeters long and it has a one millimeter long tendon. It arises from the medial aspect of the orbit and it goes over the inferior rectus and it has a relation to the lateral rectus before it goes and inserts on the posterior aspect of the eyeball that is about two millimeters inferior and two millimeters lateral to the macula. The main action of the inferior oblique is extortion and that is brought about by the anterior fibers and the elevation and the abduction is by the posterior fiber. Now coming to the grading of inferior oblique overaction. There are many methods and none of them are ideal because they have a subjective element to it. But some points has to be taken into consideration when you do an inferior oblique overaction grading. That is, the abducting eye is considered as the fixing eye and the amount of elevation the abducting eye makes with the abducting eye is taken as the grade. So the grading can be done in degrees or in relation to the pupillary border which is visible or the amount of cornea which is visible. So in this grading I have the, uh, the measurement is in degrees that is the angle between the tangent line and the horizontal line in relation to the abducting eye that is in grade one the angle is less than 15 in grade two it is less than 30 in grade three it is 60 and grade 4, it is 90. This grading is important because to decide which, which, um, which of the patients which would require inferior oblique muscle surgeries. Coming to the classification of inferior oblique overaction, it is divided primarily into primary inferior oblique overaction and secondary inferior oblique overaction. Primary means there is no definite cause which has been identified and it is usually associated with the esotropia, that is infantile esotropia, about 70%, and the ex exotropy about 30% and sometimes there won't be any horizontal strabismus and only a child is presenting with an inferior oblique overaction. A secondary inferior oblique overaction means that there is an ipsilateral esopalsy and esopalsy is the commonest of the childhood cranial nerve palsies or it can be associated with the contralateral superior rectus palsy. Now coming to the clinical features which will differentiate between primary and secondary the three uh, salient clinical features are in primary uh, inferior oblique overaction, the hypertropia is not visualized on a primary position of case, whereas in secondary, there is a primary hypertropia which is visualized, whereas the, the subjective element of torsion is not present in primary inferior oblique overaction, but it is present in a secondary inferior oblique overaction. And a hectic test, which is uh, not Visual, which is not positive in a primary is seen with a secondary inferior oblique overaction. Now coming to a differential diagnosis of a child who has the eye going in and up is first differential diagnosis is a DVD. DVD has to be differentiated from inferior oblique overaction. Sometimes you ha might have DVD and inferior oblique overaction together in that eye. Second uh, differential diagnosis is a duance with an upshoot and duance would uh, will, will the, the eye being 
having a retraction of the eyeball or the lids and the restriction of movement would give you a diagnosis of two one retraction. Another differential diagnosis is the apparent regeneration of the third nerve. And the other differential diagnosis is in a child with craniostenosis, cr cr craniostenosis erectus rotation may also mimic an inferior oblique overaction. Now, I will give you two clinical scenarios of secondary and primary inferior oblique overaction. This child came to the clinic with the mother complaining of a constant head tilt to this on the left side. And it is visualized that this child definitely has a head tilt and there is a primary position hypertrophia. So when we did the extra ocular motility in this patient, we can see there is a primary hypertrophia in this right eye. And on lateral gaze, you can see the inferior oblique overaction of grade two, which is increases on the uh, adducted position and also on elevation. And when you have the inferior oblique overaction on the down gaze, you will see that the left SO is acting, whereas the right superior oblique is definitely underacting. So once again, you can see that the left superior oblique is acting, whereas the right superior oblique is underacting. So we came to a diagnosis of right superior oblique palsy in this child. Now, this is the pre-op picture and this is the post-op picture. That is, he underwent an inferior oblique muscle recession in his right eye and you can see the head tilt has been markedly diminished and the eyes are almost orthophoric. So this is the post-op nine gaze positions pictures and you can see the inferior oblique overaction is not at all there and the eye is orthophoric. Now, indications of inferior, uh, inferior oblique muscle surgeries are inferior oblique overaction, whether it be primary or secondary, a plus two or more or inferior oblique overaction demands inferior oblique muscle surgery. And when secondly, when there is a V pattern of more than 15 prism diopters, also you would go in for an inferior oblique muscle surgery. And the another cause is inferior oblique overaction with the DVD. And that is where you do anteriorization of the inferior oblique. Now, surgeries can be graded recession, anteriorization, myectomy. Graded recession has many modifications, but what we follow is the rights modification of graded recession. Now, coming to graded recession, in this surgery, the inferior oblique is put in relation to the inferior rectus. That is a four millimeter and two millimeters lateral to the inferior rectus. This is the she spark point and which is uh, chosen and the inferior oblique is attached at, to the sclera at this point. That is in case of a grade one, but grade two Warren surgery and you put the inferior oblique in relation three millimeters inferior and two millimeters lateral to the inferior rectus. A grade three will demand a one millimeter and two millimeter in relation to the inferior rectus a grade four will, will, uh, will, where you will need the inferior oblique at the inferior rectus uh, insertion. Whereas anteriorization and uh, you would do in a patient with DVD and inferior oblique overaction. In anteriorization, the muscle is advanced beyond the inferior rectus recession and that can also be graded. And you can have it one millimeter, two millimeter and three millimeters. Now coming to the second scenario, it's a four year old girl with an infantile esotropia of you can see the esotropy about 35 prism diopters, the inferior oblique overaction in grade three, and the child also had a DVD. So we went along with a bimedial recession and an anteriorization of the inferior oblique. And you can see the eyes are orthophoric, and in the lateral gazes, the inferior oblique overaction is de uh, greatly diminished. Now, this is a small video on the inferior oblique recession, which was done in the first patient. So, an eight millimeter incision from the limbus is taken in the phonics up. and the length of the incision is 8 to 10 millimeters in length. So you identify the inferior oblique muscle, it's a flesh colored muscle. You hook onto the inferior oblique with a fine blender's hook and you take the muscle in toto, identifying a small triangular area and the whole of the muscle is in the two muscle hooks. The anterior and posterior sutures are put with a 6 0 vicle. You do a gentle cautery of the muscle. You cut the muscle and this is the inferior rectus which is identified with the muscle hook. And you mark the point, she spark point that is three millimeters and two millimeters lack of the inferior rectus. You align 
the inferior, uh, the inferior oblique, the anterior uh, sutures are put in relation to that point. And the posterior fiber sutures are just put adjacent to the anterior one. So you always keep the inferior uh, rectus in, uh, with you in the muscle hook and you tie these sutures uh, with, uh, with multiple knots, fixed zero vicular use, and you can see the bump of the inferior oblique here that goes on to the phonics, so that doesn't become a cosmetic problem, and you close the conjunctiva. Coming to the last slide of my presentation, the surgical do's and, do's and don'ts of an inferior oblique muscle surgery. You should take eight to nine millimeters from the limbus. You should gently hook on the muscle because you have the pupillary fibers along with this muscle and the sphera is indented and the muscle is hooked totally. So you have the anterior and posterior fibers in your hook. And make sure that you don't make any deep cuts in the posterior tenon because the fat may prolapse in and the, ch and the child may have an adherent syndrome postoperatively with the eye, with the, uh, the eye adhered to the fat and producing a hypertropia. And always take care of the inferior vortex vein when you go posteriorly and laterally. Thank you for your patient listening. I would like to introduce our next speaker, a young and talented pediatric ophthalmologist in RIO Trivandrum, Dr. Divya Krishan. She did her own MS Ophthal from Kuhas University and was the first rank holder in 2013. She is the best outgoing postgraduate student of RIO Trivandrum 2000 in the year 2013. She completed a long-term fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology from Aravind Eye Hospital, Tindalveli, 2016. And she was awarded the FICO in Pediatric Ophthalmology from AIOS in 2016. She is currently working in, as a Pediatric Ophthalmologist in our department in RIO Trivandrum. Over to you, Divya, for your talk. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Naina Madam, for the kind words and for giving this opportunity. So today, I will be discussing about Duane Retraction Syndrome. Duane Retraction Syndrome is a congenital eye movement disorder that is characterized by varying horizontal duction defects, together with narrowing of the palpable fissure and retraction of the globe in attempted adduction, as well as with or without upshoots and downshoots. It falls in the category of congenital cranial disinnervation disorders, which include the Mobius syndrome, the congenital fibrosis of the extraocular muscles, and the congenital facial palsy, to name a few. It was first described by Stilling and Turk, but it is more popularized by Alexander Duen, who studied 54 cases of Duans and tried to categorize and identify the etiopathogenesis and try to enumerate the management options. It accounts for 1-5% to of all strabismus cases with female left type predominance, 20% cases being bilateral, 10% familial with CHN1 gene involvement. 50% of these cases are also associated with systemic anomalies like the golden heart and the pippin. The etiopathogenesis is the most uh, oldest one is a mechanical theory in which it was believed that a tight lateral rectus was responsible for that. Anomalous bands as well as dual insertion of the medial rectus were also uh, included in it. The innervational anomalies showed that it was because of a paradoxical innervation that was occurring. As you can see in this left tie, during abduction, the left tie lateral rectus does not get an innervation, whereas during adduction, paradoxically, it gets innervation, and that is the cause of DRS. This occurs because of some abnormality that occurs during the four to eight weeks of gestation. And during this time, the sixth nerve supplying the lateral rectus is not developed. And later, the third nerve, which supplies the medial rectus, gives an apparent branch to the lateral rectus muscle. With neuroimaging techniques, we have also found that absence of the sixth cranial nerve is also a cause for DRS. Now, how to classify this? Huber has classified it into three types, uh, depending upon the electromyographical features. You can see that this is type 1 DRS, which is the most common type. And in this, the abduction is uh, restricted with retraction and narrowing of the palpable fissure on adduction. And that is because the lateral rectus is not innervated, whereas the medial rectus supplies a branch to the lateral rectus, which causes retraction and the narrowing in adduction. And core contraction causes slippage of the globe, and that can also present as upshoots and downshoots. In type 2 DRS, the sixth nerve supplies the lateral rectus, and along with that, the medial rectus third nerve also supplies the lateral rectus. So you can see that abduction is full, whereas in adduction, the contraction causes impairment of adduction. 
the type 3 DRS, sixth nerve, is not well developed, but the third nerve equally supplies the lateral and the medial rectus. So, during both erection and abduction, co contraction occurs and the globe does not move. Synergistic divergence occurs when the lateral rectus is more supplied by the medial rectus, so that on attempted adduction, abduction of the eye occurs because of the paradoxical lateral rectus. But now the school of thought is that rather than classifying it into various compartments, we have to see the Van's attraction syndrome as a spectrum, ranging the alignment from ESO to ortho to exo, attraction and upshoots from mild, moderate to severe, abduction and adduction ranging from minus 4 to full, and field of binocular vision from narrow to wide. The clinical examination should include the systematic clinical examination with emphasis on abnormal head posture, ocular motility, pattern deviations, aberrant regeneration. Topia and head starting can also help you. post duction test is a very important test because of the mechanical component that is coexisting with the innovational abnormalities. Romero Epis post degeneration test gives you the amount of lateral rectus paradoxical innervation that is occurring because when you ask the patient to abduct the eye, you find that there is a release of the resistance and you can further move the eye towards adduction. We should always keep in mind the differential diagnosis like pseudo duans which occur in medial wall fracture, inverse duan in aberrant regeneration of the third nerve and sixth nerve palsy before we come to the diagnosis of duans. The management option would include the non-surgical ones like this cyclopegic refraction and proper refractive correction because especially in ESO deviations, the hypermetropic component when corrected can alleviate the abnormal head posture to some extent. Surgery is always complicated because of the violation of loss of ocular motility, aberrant innovations, varying degrees of paralysis and fibrosis of the extraocular muscles. So when you see an ortho DRS with minimal retraction and minimal abduction restriction, we have to think twice before deciding on surgery. So what are the sure short indications for surgery? When there is an abnormal head posture, when there is severe globe retraction, when there are severe upshoots, and when there is a primary position deviation, then you are justified in doing surgery in case of Duane syndrome. The surgical plan should base itself on the deviation in the primary position like ESO, ortho, or exo DRS. Then we have to know about the upshoots and the downshoots, the globe retraction, and also FDT should be done in multiple stages. Management of an ESO DRS would mean the assessment of the deviation in the primary position if it is less than 20% diopters, then, and you have to do a FDT. If you find that MR is tight, then MR is session of the affected eye. If MR is not tight, you can do a superior rectus transposition or a partial vertical rectus transposition. For deviations more than 20% diopters in primary position, bilateral asymmetric MR recession with more recession of the contralateral normal eye should be done. Superior rectus transposition with or without augmented sutures actually have the advantage of increasing the abduction force also and it was actually done by Dr. Hunter et al. and you can see the very good results with not only the correction of the ESO deviation but also improvement of abduction but some cases have induced torsional diplopia. If there is globe retraction associated you have to go for lateral rectus recession of the affected eye with asymmetric bilateral MR recessions. In upshoots and downshoots a Y split should be done. In Y splitting, you split the lateral rectus into two parts and it's sutured with some amount of recession with the two halves separate. Resection was contraindicated, was the earlier thought, but studies by Stephen Kraft and Dr. Andrea Molinari have shown that resection can be done for small and for uh, ESO deviations of at least 25 PD with abduction limitation of minus 3.5 with mild or no upshoots or downshoots. If it is an exo DRS with normal LR activity in abduction, we have to look for the upshoots. If no upshoots, a simple LR recession can help you. Whereas if upshoots are present, LR recession with Y split should be done. With normal, without normal LR activity in abduction, a lateral rectus periosteal fixation or supramaximal lateral rectus recession with or without partial vertical rectus transposition should be done. In ortho DRS with upshoots, equitable recession of both medial rectus and lateral rectus with Y split of the lateral rectus is done. I would like to discuss this case of an ESO DRS of the right type with an abnormal head posture. And you can see that the severity of the palpebral fissure narrowing and upshoots. And so we decided to do surgery. Intraoperative FDT was positive. The medial rectus was tight. So we did a medial rectus recession. Now you can see that six cervical sutures are passed through the medial rectus. Medial rectus is 
this inserted and four millimeter recession of the medial rectus muscle is done. The lateral rectus is identified and by using a blunt muscle hook, it is recessed to as far as it is divided, it is split into two half to as far posterior as possible. And then you pass, these are the two split parts of the lateral rectus, which are attached at the insertion. Then you pass the six zero vital sutures through each of this part, superior and inferior half. And once that is done, the muscle is disinserted And the two halves are placed about 20 millimeters apart with a recession. So that gives the lateral rectus the shape of a Y. And this Y split actually prevents the slippage of the globe and so uh, it uh, decreases the upshoots and downshoots. This is supposed to result. You can see that the retraction has uh, decreased and the upshoots and downshoots have disappeared. So this is a surgical algorithm that is given in IGO by Pradeep Sharma et al. The take home message that I would like to give you is that for any case of DRS, rather than depending upon the etiological as classification factors, it is better to customize the management depending upon the needs of the patient for a better result. I thank Naina Madam, Meenakshi Madam, and all my teachers at RIO and Aravind for this opportunity. Thank you. It is with great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Neelam Pawar. She is working as the consultant in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus services, Aravind Eye Hospital, Tindalveli. She has a wide expertise in pediatric cataract management, strabismus, both simple and complex surgeries. She is involved in teaching in national and international SICs and FACO training programs. She is a great inspiration to her residents and colleagues for her clinical acumen, surgical skills and a passion for publication in peer-reviewed journals. In 2016, she underwent a short-term fellow observership in Jules Sheen Eye Institute in UCLA, Los Angeles. In also in Wilmer Eye Institute, John Hopkins Hospital, Baltimore, USA. She did her fellowship in IUL and cataract in Arvind Tirnalveli, 2006 and 2007. She completed her MS in ophthalmology from MGM Medical College, Indore. She got her MBBS from NSCB Medical College, Jabalpur in the year 2000. She has completed 10,000 cataracts and both SICs and FACO and has done innumerable squin surgeries and pediatric cataract surgeries. She is a reviewer in Journal of Clinical Ophthalmology and Research, Ophthalmology Research and International Journal, Journal of Clinical Studies and Medical Case Report. Her passion for publication has led her to publish 17 publications in indexed journals so far. Over to you, Madam, for your talk. Good morning, everybody. At the onset, I would like to thank KSOS and Dr. Naina for providing me this opportunity to present. So I will be speaking on pediatric third and sixth cranial nerve palsies. So unlike adults, children have developing visual system which is liable to develop amblyopia, and therefore appropriate management of childhood cranial nerve palsies is mandatory. Dysfunction of the third cranial nerve results from lesions anywhere between the oculomotor nucleus in the midbrain and extraocular muscle. The most common etiology of third nerve uh, palsy is congenital, followed by postnatal trauma, infection, inflammation, tumor, and childhood migraine. Aneurysms are rare. Other studies have also reported congenital as most common cause of pediatric third nerve palsy, followed by trauma, tumor, vascular, and other causes. Congenital third nerve palsy is characterized by 
frequent aberrant regenerations and is accompanied by neurological deficit. And all children presenting with congenital acquired cranial nerve third palsy should have neuroimaging being done. Acquired cases have sudden onset of binocular horizontal vertical diplopia and droopy eyelid. And children with congenital third nerve palsies may not complain of diplopia due to amblyopia. Primary apparent regeneration is classical sign of slow growing lesion in cavernous sinus schwannomas. So what to look for in third nerve palsies? Superior oblique action, aberrant regeneration, lateral rectus action, and pupillary involvement. Whether globe is crossing midline or not, whether it is a partial or complete palsy, post junction test, post generation test, sockets, significance of ptosis, any variability, and fatigability. Differential diagnosis includes intracranial lesion, orbital diseases, congenital fibrosis of extraocular muscles, myasthenia gravis, and ophthalmoplegic migraine. MRI and MRI are the first line diagnostic imaging modality. Number punctures should be done in cases of meningeal involvement, and evaluation for myasthenia gravis should be done. Management includes Children with infections, inflammatory or neoplastic lesion should have appropriate therapy, prism therapy for small angle deviation and strabismus surgery for functional and cosmetic alignment. Amlyopia therapy is effective in congenital disease and ptosis surgery. Goals of surgery are to allow single binocular vision and to normalize the appearance of affected eye so that child has positive social impact. Factors affecting surgical decision are magnitude of underaction of muscle, muscle sickly, functional versus cosmesis. So surgical options available are if there is a residual MR function, maximal recession and resection of the horizontal recti of same or other eye should be done. If there is no medial rectus action, then lateral rectus periosteal fixation along with large medial rectus resection is preferred and globe anchoring to medial orbital wall along with large lateral rectus recession is also another alternative. So this is the pre-op and post-op photo of a young boy who had congenital third cranial nerve palsy in which supramaximal LR recession of 14 mm and MR resection of 6 mm was done and uh, the boy had good cosmetic correction. This is the case of bilateral third cranial palsy because of tubercular meningitis and in this uh, photo you can see that all the movements are uh, limited and the eye is grossly uh, abducted and after surgery you can see that there is improvement in the cosmosis and right now eye is slightly moving to the midline with the decrease in the uh, face turn. So lateral rectus periosteal fixation is preferred in cases wherever there is contracture of the lateral uh, rectus and whenever lateral rectus is uh, tight. Lateral rectus is isolated and fibroethibone which are non-absorbable suture are passed at both the ends and then the muscle is disinserted from its uh, insertion and uh, periosteum is nicely di dissected and these two ends are attached to the periosteum. One has to have a wide exposure of the periosteum uh, because it is quite deep and it is slightly difficult to fixate it with the periosteum. Once the periosteal fixation is done, then the tenons closure is very important so that lateral rectus should not again go and attach to sclera and should not again start functioning. pre approach for medial orbital wall periosteal anchoring is also a good alternative. What are the newer options? 
they are medial transposition of stick lateral rectus muscle, which is gogated technique. And along with transposition of lateral rectus to medial rectus, augmentation can be done and adjustable sutures can also be done. Simplified gogated technique and lateral rectus and medial rectus reunion have also been reported in pediatric third nerve palsy. In the original Gogate techniques, the split half of the lateral rectus were passed under superior rectus and superior oblique and inferior rectus and inferior oblique and these split ends were then uh, in, uh, were placed near the medial rectus insertion. But because of the uh, complications like choroidal effusion and serous retinopathy, Gogate has modified technique in which the muscle split and are uh, just passed below the superior rectus and inferior rectus and then attached to the medial rectus. So, so this is the video which shows uh, split LR transposition to the medial rectus. Here the lateral rectus is isolated and it is split and then the two split ends are then transposed to the medial rectus. So this is the superior half of the lateral rectus and with help of a hook which is having a hole this split half is shifted towards the medial rectus under the superior oblique and superior rectus and in this case posterior tenectomy of superior oblique was also done because the uh, patient has vertical deviation and then this split half is attached near the medial rectus both ends are attached and similarly, inferior rectus is isolated. Uh, and the split the lower half of the lateral rectus is uh, taken out from this inferior rectus and inferior oblique uh, complex. And then this is attached at the uh, lateral end of the medial rectus. This is the patient in which this procedure was done and this is a young man who had a, a, a traumatic third nerve palsy at childhood and after uh, split LR transposition, he had very good cosmetic result. Other options available are adjustable nasal transposition and augmentation of the split the lateral rectus near the uh, medial rectus. Now coming to pediatric six nerve palsy, it is most common ocular motor palsy because of its long and tortuous course. It is most commonly affected cranial nerve in children and it should be distinguished from Duan's retraction syndrome and Mobius syndrome. Neoplasm are the commonest cause of six nerve palsy in pediatric age group, followed by idiopathic traumatic congenital inflammatory and uh, viral uh, causes. All cases, irrespective of whether it is committant or incommittent isotropia, uh, and they should have neuroimaging being done. A child with six nerve palsy usually present with face towards the palatic lateral rectus with abduction limitation and isotropia in post-primary gaze. Traumatic six nerve palsy occurs in combination with intracranial hemorrhages and skull fractures. And in uh, this case, the child has acute ET because of congenital polystatoma. This girl presented to us with acute ET after polio drop. And this child had acute ET after viral fever. Sometimes uh, rare uh, things like carotid cavernous fistula can be presenting sign uh, as acute abdicin nerve palsy in pediatric age group. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension can also present as acute onset esotropia along with headache and vomiting. If the deviations are small, better to wait for surgery and prisms can be give, uh, given. And uh, transposition surgeries or RNR surgery depends whether the globe is crossing the midline, how is FTT, how is FGT, and how are the sackets. So usually in most of the cases, spontaneous recovery occurs in cases of unilateral six nerve palsy. And if there is usually traumatic six nerve palsy also resolved, and if there is failure to recover by six months, then the surgical options should be considered. 
botulinum toxin to medial rectus is a very good option. Intermatic 6 nerve palsy in, in acute isotropias because it restores the binocularity and this prevents the amniopia development and also medial rectus contracture. And later, uh, any transposition surgeries can be done. If there is poor or no LR function, then transposition surgeries are mainstay. Transposition surgeries include Hamalshin and Jensen, in which splits half of the superior rectus and inferior rectus, they are sutured near the medial rectus. While in cases of augmented Hamalshin, the split ends, they are uh, there is partial resection done and then split uh, ends are inserted uh, at the insertion of lateral rectus. Double augmentation and vertical rectus transposition are also reported uh, to be good option in cases of pediatric six nerve palsy. Superior rectus transposition and medial rectus recession and partial VRT with Scott's posterior fixation augmentation and Nishida's procedures and adjustable cross-section partial VRT has also been reported in pediatric six nerve palsy. So with different vertical rectus muscle transposition procedures in abdicin nerve palsy, the results are variable. So this video shows the different procedures which are done in cases of uh, sixth nerve palsy. Initial cases of recovery, a Botox injection can be given and later on transposition procedure in form of Hamalshin or Jensen can be done. This video shows Hamalshin procedure in which superior rectus is isolated and it is split up to 15 millimeter from its insertion and six of vitro suture is passed at the insertion, then the split half is disinserted and the split half is sutured near the lateral rectus. Similarly, inferior half, uh, similarly, the lateral half of the inferior rectus is also sutured near the lateral rectus. In augmented Hamalshin, along with this transposition, a partial resection of around 3 to 4 mm is also done. So here, the superior rectus is isolated. Again, it is flipped. Two sutures are passed, which are almost 4 mm away from the insertion. And once the suture is passed, then the muscle is disinserted from its original insertion and this is then attached near the lateral rectus. And after attaching it to the sclera uh, near lateral rectus, then the resection of muscle can be done. Similarly, inferior rectus is isolated. It is split into two halves and the lateral half is again uh, two features are placed which are 4 mm from the original insertion and it is attached near the lateral rectus and then a section is done. So the advantage of augmented uh, Hamalshin is that it is more effective and it also prevents anterior segment ischemia and to, uh, lateral augmentation is uh, you can avoid lateral augmentation. In double augmentation, along with the resection uh, at 8 mm, uh, uh, the bond suture is passed for augmentation. Another good option is Nishida surgery, in which there is no split, no tenotomy, and uh, one fourth to two third of the muscle is taken, both superior rectus and inferior rectus. They are taken and this muscle with the, and both the muscle without splitting, they are attached to the sclera near the lateral rectus. The advantage of Nishida surgery is that you can avoid the anterior segment ischemia complications. So 
in pediatric cases, timely management of cranial nerve palsy, along with the proper planning to avoid the complications of strabismus surgery, you can give good cosmetic results so that child can live a happy life with good uh, cosmetic appearance. Thank you for patience listening.